one. Thank you. All right, I can stand here. I can stand here and not be in the way. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Wallingsford Zoning Board of Adjustment. Uh, today's date is September 12, 2018. Uh, this is the first meeting of the newly appointed uh, Board of Adjustment, and we adopted some uh, rules of procedure. So, um, it's looking at the order of business, I believe that the um, now that I've called the, uh, the, the, the case that meeting forward, that there needs to be a roll call by the reporting secretary. Okay. Uh, of the members. So members <laughs> present are Paul Caziel, who is an alternate. Um, Sunny Foss, who uh, is a full member. John Hisman, acting chair, who is usually the vice chair. Deanna Rolo, a full member. Andrew Jack, a member. And more alternate. Alternate. Okay. All right. Um, so then we'll begin the, the public uh, portion of this hearing. There are no minutes of previous meetings because this is our first uh, meeting. There's no unfinished business. So um, for the purposes of tonight's hearing, uh, because the chairperson has uh, recused himself, I believe I need to designate an alternate for tonight's meeting to sit as a voting member. And okay, so I don't need to do that. Okay, and I won't do that. All right. Um, so the uh, new procedure indicates that the secretary will read the application before the board. All right, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going by the... Okay. <laughs> so, uh, the application is submitted by, um, I'm sorry, Phil and Bonnie. 
Johnny Jennison. Um, uh, 125 Bear Road, Rollinsford, New Hampshire. Um, and they are applying for a variance, and I'm just going to read straight from the application. The underside, undersigned hereby requests a variance to the terms of Article Section 7, footnote 9, and ask that said terms be waived to permit a lot line adjustment between lot numbers 7.3 and 7.4, tax map 3, allowing a 9,500 square foot quote unquote even swap of land between the lots, resulting in a gross area of 2 acres per lot. And I'm not going to have her read the attached sheets with you. Okay. Read those by. Um, and then, would you like me to read the letter's notice? Please do that, yes. So I have Scott and Ellen Aragoni, Mark West of West Environmental, McHugh Revocable Trust of 1996. Bonnie and Phil Jennison, Revocable Trust of 2017. William and Karen Staines, The Buxton Revocable Trust. Paul Connolly of Civil Works, New England. Miles and Evan England, The Cavalson Revocable Living Trust. Um, and looking at, again, our procedure, um, we've gone over the public notice and how personal notice was given. Um, the way we're going to do this is that um, we're going to have um, the applicant uh, provide a statement as to what um, he's looking for, and then um, the board can ask questions at any point during the testimony. Um, then after that uh, portion ends, we'll then open up the meeting to uh, members of the, of the public and abutters who wish to uh, ask questions or provide a posi uh, position. When you do that, you'll be asked to state your name and address. Um, and now I'm gonna freeze. then we'll go, for, go from there, essentially, and, and head to deliberations later on. So, uh, Mr. Connolly. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Connolly. I'm a civil engineer and land surveyor. I practice in the Stratford and Rockingham County areas. And I am here this evening on behalf of Phil and Bonnie Jennison. Phil is sitting to my right. And Phil and Bonnie reside at 125 Bear Road, um, which is shown as lot 7-4 on the Rollinsford uh, tax maps. Um, number three, I believe. Um, they have owned that lot since June of 1985. Um, shortly after purchasing that lot in 1985, they um, proceeded to build their home there and um, pool and each field and so on and so forth and have, have resided there for the past 33 years. Um, prior to that, uh, the, the land was owned by Ruth Emerson and that lot and the lot behind Phil, which fronts on Fresh Creek Road, known as Lot 7 3, Tax Map 3, um, both of those lots, as, uh, as well as five others, came out of the Emerson parcel um, in 1980 by subdivision that was approved by the Rollinsford Planning Board. Um, so those lots all came out over the years and have been sold to different people and homes and built on them. Uh, in 1981, Lot 73 on Fresh Creek Road was purchased by George and Louise Marston, and they've owned that and been taxed on it as a building lot for the past 36 years. Uh, in uh, May of last year, Phil and Bonnie um, purchased uh, Lot 73 from uh, uh, Louise Marston. So what you have before you this evening um, by our application is basically and simply just two requests. Um, one is for um, an equitable waiver of dimensional requirements. Um, we found this to be necessary after we went in there and did some survey work and we 
found that Phil and Bonnie's house was um, a little bit encroaching, at least at the garage, on the front 50-foot yard setback, and a little bit encroaching on the uh, left side yard, or the, the yard adjacent to Fresh Creek Road, um, and that encroachment is about 12 feet, where, um, uh, again, 50 feet is required. They were roughly at about 38 feet there. Um, I don't think anyone has known that until we just, again, done that survey this past fall. So, um, with that, what I would like to do in front of the board is take these two requests uh, separately to the dimensional um, equitable weight waiver of uh, dimensional requirements first, and then take the variance request after that. That's what we're looking for. Alright, uh, so um, there's uh, Mr. Connolly. Is, uh, well, let's have first have a discussion on that. So, members of the board, Mr. Connolly is opposed to dealing with um, these two matters uh, as a whole. He'd like to deal with them separately, meaning the um, equal waiver of dimensional requirements first and separately and have us, I believe, vote on that and then um, proceed in regard to the variance and do members have any comments about whether we should uh, handle it as one or separately? Is there a reason that it was submitted as one application and not two separate requests? Just for efficiency. Because it was one application. Okay. I really All right. it was. So. But two. Two. Yeah. Now, see, if it's one, it's all or nothing. If it's two, at least he's got two. It's one to set for you. Mm hmm. Well, it's. Uh, it's I, I only seek this because of the criteria for the granting of the equitable waiver um, is entirely different and criteria required for granting variance. In fact, uh, I don't know uh, the, the equitable waiver request is a uh, relatively new uh, statute. I don't know if this board has even ever dealt with an equitable, equitable waiver request. We're familiar with it. You are? Yes, sir. Yeah. Good. So it's all it's all pursuant to the uh, statute, uh, which is New Hampshire RSA 674-33-A, um, and I won't um, reread the statute, but if I could just uh, uh, enter into the record the reasons why the equitable waiver should be uh, granted. I don't mean to have my back to the crowd here, but it's, uh, maybe I can swing around the front here just to be a little bit more forthcoming to the audience. <coughs> well, before we do that, Paul, shouldn't we have a vote on how you're going to proceed? So that? Paul, what? Paul on the board. Uh, what, what's your opinion on how we should proceed? Uh, they should be se separate because they are independent. Okay. Ken, what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, one application. Seems like be best way to go. Okay. All right. So, I think how we're going to do it is so the uh, the four of us voting members. So. Um, There's two in favor of it being one, one uh, way, and you're in favor of it being separately. Paul and Ken aren't, aren't voting members. If I vote uh, with you, then it's a tie. If I vote with uh, yeah. Thurs, then there's one count right now. There's one count right now. Okay. So you've got to break the tie. So I have to break the tie. The pressure is on. We, we, we can do it together. I mean, I don't want to put the board in an awkward position. I was just trying to keep this... As efficient and, 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 and 
to members of the public to meet Paula for stumbling here, uh, again, being our first run-through. Um, so if you're withdrawing that request, then we'll just deal with it all in one. So again, um, Phil and Bonnie built the house in 1985, and um, come to find out by a survey that we just did, um, the front right corner of the garage is a couple feet too close to Bear Road, and the front left corner of the house is about 12 feet too close to Fresh Creek Road. This is the garage. This is the house here. Now, I've been working in town since late 1985, and I've always known the front yard setbacks to be 50 feet from a road. Um, so it's pretty, pretty obvious, right? But his septic, I just found this out the other day when I, I pulled out the, the ancient septic system plans for the house. Um, his uh, uh, plans show that the setback to Fresh Creek Road was 35 feet. I don't know where that came from. Uh, certainly it's more than 35 feet, 1238. But um, I just thought I'd throw that into the record. It, it's, uh, it, was, it was an anom anomaly that I didn't call seeing until I review the file again. Um, but in any case, it is what it is. And as such, um, the points that are important relative to the statute are that, um, as I said, they purchased the house, or purchased the land in June of 1985. They immediately constructed their home. Um, our recent boundary survey of December 2017 revealed these setback issues. Um, actually the, the survey revealed that the front and the side of the existing two-story dwelling and garage are setbacks slightly less than uh, about 3 feet and 12 feet respectively from Bear Road and Press Street Road. Uh, this condition has now existed for over th 33 years. No enforcement in action or notice of violation has ever commenced against uh, the genesis relative to the subject setback issues. The subject dimensional setback issues were not discovered until the survey in 2017. The subject violations were not an outcome of ignorance of the law or ordinance, failure to acquire obfuscation, misrepresentation, or bad faith on the part of the genesis but were caused by a good faith error in measurement by the Genesis. The violation does not constitute a public or private nuisance nor diminish the value of other property in the area, nor interfere with or adversely affect any present or permissible future uses of any such property. And then finally, due to the degree of the past construction or investment made in ignorance of the facts constituting the violation, the cost of correction so far outweighs any public benefit to be gained, it would be inequitable to require the violation to be corrected or rectified. So with all that, we believe that it's uh, the bees, the board, grant an equitable waiver to allow these setbacks to remain as they have for the past 33 years. Um, these need to be acted on irregardless of the variance request, because um, it may apply to some point in the future when the Janisons decide to sell their home. So does the board want to, uh, anyone want to ask questions? I know we're going to vote on this as a whole, but does anyone have questions for the best portion of the... Uh, Yes, please. Paul, oh. what was the zoning requirement in 85? I thought. The reason I say that is I've got the same situation. Right now, my house does not meet zoning requirements, but it did back in 88. And then the dimensions have changed. But if I didn't know that, I would be in the situation you're in. I'm trying to tell you is, were you legal for 85 when that building permit was signed? Well, certainly for the right front corner of the garage, no, because that's about 48 feet or so. But was it 50 and 85? Yes. 
It was. So how do we get to 48 then if it was 50? Er error measurement. I mean, the wall out there, Sonny, is probably three foot wide, give or take. Um, you measure from the wrong side of the wall, it would easily come to the wrong dimension back to where the garage should have been. Was the garage and the, and the home constructed all at the same time? It was, okay. Uh, Mr. Jennison, you're, you're a contractor. Did you build the house yourself or yes. did you, you did yes. build it yourself? Okay. And you were in construction at that time? Yes. Okay. At, at the time we built the house, you did not have to do a certified plot plan, which is required nowadays. It, this wouldn't have happened um, nowadays because if you build a house nowadays, you have to be within the setback areas. If you put a foundation in, it has to be surveyed, and you have to be within the setback, wait the setback, or you can go further than the foundation to the foot of the But back then, it wasn't, it wasn't required. Um, nowadays, you have to have a certified plot plan before you can go on. There's, I think there's two or three other houses on here, though, that are in Crooks. I'm not convinced that you actually Point, I'm not sure we need it either. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to take any chances. It, so I, I don't know if we should grant something that's really not needed. Because this is really not to be taken lightly, not to be waiver. I mean it's just not something that just arbitrarily would hand out. And we do not take it lightly, but we do look to the law to No, I understand what you're saying. Follow that. So, and I think all the criteria set forth in six seventy four. I do have a question on the, on, the, on the setback that's more egregious, that's closer to the Fresh Creek Road. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the unknown of, was it 50 feet at that time that the structure was built? Yes. We built before that, so okay. I'll be quiet. Sorry, not my turn. Let's just say it was. Okay. Okay. And this is not to point any fingers or put anyone culpable, but um, Phil had a resident of the town, Bob Burson, uh, prepare the septic system plans. There they are right here. Okay. Well, there's, there's two residents in the town. Well, a person was a resident of the town. Yes. So, um, he was at the time, but he, at one point he wasn't. So anyway, I looked, at, I looked at the plan, and um, you can see right here, he shows a side here at setback of 35 feet from Fresh Creek Road. But that's the septic plan. Yeah. I don't know how you're going to find out. Yeah, I, I think the septic what? approval is shows 50. It shows 50 from, from Bear Road, right? 50 from Bear. Yeah. And 35 from Fresh Creek. But I don't know. I mean. So, what about the proposed plans for the actual construction of the house that were? as far as locating it on the property. This is it. I thought this was just the septic design. Oh, it was included with the septic design? Yeah. So, for lack of a better expression, um, I think this is an honest mistake. That's why the RSA 67433 was developed to basically cover an honest mistake, or, whereas the alternative would just seem to be, for lack of a better word, ridiculous. I mean, what sense would it make to pull up the whole house, move it over 12 feet, and back two feet? It's been there 
was in Freddie for 33 years. As you stated in your in your remarks, you know the town has not issued any violations, so it, it's reasonable to to believe that there will be no violations going forward. I, I agree with Sunny that is this really a necessary waiver? My concern is is the effect that it has on the Fresh Creek Road and and the encroachment within that 50 feet setback. Any other um, questions for the board of this particular issue? Okay. So since we're dealing with all of one in one uh, matter, then I'm going to have you go into the next part of it, Paul, and then I'll open everything up to public discussion. Yeah. So again, back in uh, 1980, um, these two lots were created by subdivision, and the I don't mean to turn away from the crowd, but uh, the division line between um, Phil and Bonnie's house lot here, 7 4, and the lot on Fresh Creek Road is presently shown as the green line right here. Okay? That was the border right here, the green line, yep. before they bought that lot. Right. Okay. Yep. Still is to this date. Um, Phil and Bonnie would like to build a house on the back lot, sell their front house. I mean, their, their kids are all grown up, and it's just the two of them. And the back lot is not an easy lot to build on, as it is right now. Um, back in 1980, there were no regulations, subdivision regulations, specific to excluding areas on lots with steep slopes, with wetlands, with easements or right-of-ways excluding those from the net area, two acres, required in this zone. And case in point is that on the front lot and the back lot, there are steep slopes. They're shown in, in gray here. And there's wetlands on the back lot, back here at the low part. Back in here. So, technically speaking, both lots right now, pursuant to existing 2018 zoning ordinance, are non-conforming. They don't have a net two acres exclusive of steep slopes, wetlands, easements, right-of-ways, that type of thing, both less. So back to what they would like to do, um, in wanting to build on the back lot, there is a, a rather good area right here, exclusive of steep slopes, and it's quite close to the wetlands. Um, that would be a good place for a house. So we said, okay, let's just do a lot line adjustment between Phil's front lot and the back lot, which is represented by the two orange boxes. Those are two equal areas that would just be swapped. Uh, the parcel shown as A would come out of the back lot and be, uh, become part of lot 7-4. And the parcel shown as B in orange would come out of the front lot and be appended to the back lot, which is shown as lot 7 3. Well, here's the old lot line, and here's the new lot line. Even swap. Now, if either one of these two little swap lots didn't have steep slopes, we wouldn't even be here. Okay, because it would be an even trade. Um, it, it, swapping those those two even pieces would not make either lot either any more conforming or more non-conforming. But by doing this, and because this pink cross portion of parcel A is containing steep slopes, we therefore, by appending it to front lot 7-4, we make 7-4 a little bit less conforming that it has more steep slopes now, but at the same time, we make lot 7-3 a little bit more conforming, and we make a better place to build up here. Now, we try to build back here in this steep slope area without doing this swap, but A, you would have to get a conditional use permit from the planning board and the conservation commission to build on steep slopes. B, it would be over closer to the wetlands. 
And why would you want to do that uh, when an easy solution exists to uh, not have to touch or impact the steep slopes, which are, cons which are considered to be conservation areas now by the zoning ordinance? Oh, can you even build that back lot? Is, is that would that be off of Class 6 Road? Well, good that you asked that question. Although it's really not all that germane right now to this board, um, the 1980 subdivision approval in a plan that was endorsed by this planning board, this is the zoning board, the, the town planning board, um, contained two conditions of approval. And those conditions are stated verbatim in our note number 12 on the plan that we submitted to you. And they say, quote, the approval is subject to restrictions on lot number one. That's lot 7-3, one off of Fresh Creek Road. One, no building shall be erected on this lot until town reopens the section of Fresh Creek Road by voting to remove gates and bars. And two, road, Fresh Creek, is brought up to acceptable town standards. So, in order to build back here, pull a building permit, have a selectman sign that building permit, issue it, Bill and Bonnie have to address those issues with the select board. Just to review, if I may. Sure. Uh, lots 7.3 and 7.4 were created by subdivision and approved by the planning board in September of 1980. And lots 7-3 and 7-4 are respectively shown as lots number one and two on the approved subdivision plan. Uh, two, both lot number 7.3 and 7-4 contain land areas with steep slopes as defined as slopes greater than 25% the zoning ordinance definitions. Lot number 73 also contains jurisdictional wetland areas. Four, either lot contains utility easements or right of ways. Five, footnote number nine did not exist in 1980. When I say footnote number nine, that's in the zoning ordinance, and that's the footnote that says in that area of a lot you can't have steep slopes, you can't have wetlands, can't have right ways, can't have <coughs> Number six, both lots 7.3 and 7.4 at two acres each were conforming in land area as created in 1980. That's why the planning board signed the plan. Both lots 7.3 and 7.4 are now non conforming lots with regard to net lot area free from steep slopes and wetlands. Neither one conform. The Genesis as owner of lot of lots 73 seek to build a small ranch on the said lot. We also own lot 7 4. Number 9, the front portion of lot 7 3 is encumbered with steep slopes. I just pointed that out. As you move from front to rear in lot 7 3, you emerge from steep slopes but get closer to wetlands and also remain in moderately sloped land. Uh, number 10, the Genesis seek to adjust the common lot line between lot 7 3 and 7 4 as such. Then a 9,500 square foot, more or less, level portion of lot 74 would be appended to the front of lot 73 and would be swapped for an equal size land area out of lot 7S3 as would be appended to the rear of lot 74. About one half of a portion of the land coming out of lot 73 contains steep slopes, and the portion of land coming out of 74 is level. As such, Pursuant to the provisions of footnote number 9, lot 7 4 becomes slightly more non conforming, okay, that's Phil's existing house lot on 25 Bear Road, slightly less non conforming because it has a little bit more steep slope way out back. The buildable portion of lot 7 3 becomes larger and practical. The building potential of lot 7 4 is unchanged, whereas Said lot was developed in 1985 by the Genesis. Then finally, the proposed buildable portion of lot 7S3, 7S3 thus becomes 90 feet plus or minus closer to Bear Road. So if I can 
just go through the criteria required to for this board to grant a variance. In this case, number one, the granting of the variance would not be contrary to the public interest. The subject lots are existing lots of record. No additional lots are being created. The quality of lot 7-3 is being increased and no harm or diminishment in quality is of lot 7-4. Arguably, the public interest is better served with a better quality build area on lot 7-3. Granting this variance is consistent with the spirit of the ordinance. The well, stated, I stopped in and asked a question. So did that statement that the quality of lot 7-3 is being increased and no harm and diminishment to the quality of lot 7-4. Aren't you adding more steep slope to 7-4? Yes. So it isn't that diminishing 7-4? Not with regard to the approved area. So I should have stated that in, the, in my text. The approved area of lot 7-4 is Phil's house, the garage, the pool, the shed, the backyard, the leach field, mm -hmm. all up close to Bear Road. This portion of lot 7-4 that would need to contain the steep slopes is all the way out in the back right hand corner. Okay, all right, please go on. Number two, the granting of the, of the variance is consistent with the spirit of the ordinance as stated in section one of the zoning ordinance. <coughs> the Roundsford zoning ordinance and its regulations are designed among other things to promote and conserve the health, safety, convenience, and welfare of the, of the inhabitants, to encourage appropriate interrelationships of land uses and groups of land uses in various parts of town to secure a safety from fire, panic, epidemics, and other dangers, including flooding, to provide adequate access of light and air, to avoid undue concentration of population, to lessen congestion in the streets, to prevent overcrowding of land, and so forth. End of quote. The intent of the zoning ordinance is not in any way compromised by the request of variance. The intent of the ordinance is better served by creating a higher quality lot 7S3 at no expense to the quality of 7S4. And that should have said no, no expense to the approved area of lot 7S4. Okay. Number three, the granting of the variance will result in substantial justice. In this case, substantial justice would, will be realized by providing a better building area on lot 7S3, increased building and septic system setbacks from jurisdictional wetlands, and zero impacts to existing steep slope areas. Before granting this variance will not result in diminished values of surrounding properties. There is no aspect of the proposed lot line adjustment that can possibly injure or diminish values of any surrounding property. And then finally, five, literal enforcement of the provisions of section seven, footnote number nine, will result in unnecessary hardships. If the proposed lot line adjustment could not take place, the following would result. A, request for conditional use permit, as I stated before, in construction and grading on steep slopes. B, construction closer to jurisdictional wetlands. C, more removal of existing trees and vegetative cover. D, more earthwork would be required. And E, higher site development cost. So I guess, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, certainly, I'm willing to Answer any and all questions sure. the board or the public may have. Um, all right. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask members of the board. I know the public is very patient. I appreciate that. If there are any questions that they have, Mr. Conway, Mr. Jennison, in regard to the second part of this presentation. Mr. Chairman, I'll of the house, a septic tank, or well, or uh, will that all uh, you know, conform to the town, state, and federal requirements? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. They have not been finalized, but okay. suffice it and safe to say that the house, the septic system, and the well will all be in the general area of these uh, level swap area noted as parcel A on the submitted plans. Roughly right here. Now some of the house construction goes beyond the the lot line that would be abandoned over in here. Basically everything takes place right there. 
That's why we showed the, lot, the uh, setbacks here to show that we could meet them. And the thing I see is with the proposal of lot 7.3 will still be only 50% of the required minimum lot, lot size. Net. Yes. Well, net, which is the same as the minimum lot, lot size, which is total area minus uh, the wetlands and the uh, steep slopes. Yes, that's just about precisely right. Um, the existing net area for lot 7-3 is 0.87 acres, and then the proposed net area is one acre, so it actually increases a little bit. And the front lot where Phil's house is decreases a little bit from net 1.91 down to net 1.79. And so, so that's why I asked you if you would be meeting all the uh, building regulations uh, by the state, the town, and the federal government. So we've got Half, half the lot to be able to work on. And that's why we're here tonight, to, to permit this, this lot of interest. Otherwise, I can answer the question in another way. We, we do not expect to come back to this board because the house they want to build fits within the setback lines. And we've done a test bit out there, and we know that it passes um, and can support a septic system that would be approvable by the town and by the state. Now, concerning the rights that, that you have, have you done any improvements since since 1985 to lot 7.3? Uh, you did state that that you know, you know that you were paying property taxes as you build the lot. Somebody else, somebody else was just paying. I haven't purchased it last year. Yeah. Oh, okay, it's but, it's but, but somebody else was. Yes, this so, is Austin Bader, though. So those rights are tra tra transferred to the you know, no, no improvements have been made. Okay, and concerning the property taxes, uh, we said, said that on lot 7.3 that you were paying property taxes as a bill of the law. Yes, from I, there was a time when we could access that information online, and I remember seeing that last yeah, year. Yeah, uh, you can't access that information anymore, at least online. But, when I did look at it late last year, it was, and I could see the history, and that's the property taxes had been paid uh, on it. Yeah. But I guess the thing which I'm getting at was, you know, was you paying property taxes for, at a 100% assessment for the net area? The property taxes, from my memory, were not equivalent to a full size two acre lot net on a paved class five highway. They were more consistent with a lot that recognized town recognized was on a class six highway and you know had some wetlands and steep slopes on it. I think the town rephrased it at thirty four thousand at the time she was paying taxes on it. That's what they were taxing on thirty four thousand local assessment. Because they considered the wetlands or they considered the steep slopes First Creek is closed. First Creek Road. Yes, it's closed. Subject to gates and bars. Correct. So, when you split this, this piece is actually going to become landlocked. Right. It was landlocked up until he bought it, pretty much. Fresh Creek Road is really not open. It needs to be opened by the town meeting. There's no board in town that can open that road by state law. Well, we're going down a road of discussion that's really not germane and pertinent to the issues before the board tonight. But I will tell you, and this is very, very much uh, uh, a portion of state law and policy that's been well trod. It was a very thick book on the whole matter. And 
despite the fact that Fresh Creek Road is classified as a Class 6 highway subject to gates and bars, yep. does not mean that it is landlocked. He can access his property over Fresh Creek Road right now, as can anybody else with property on Fresh Creek Road. They have the right, and the public has the right, to use and trot over Fresh Creek Road. Bicycles, yep. by foot, so forth. So it is an open road. It's just subject to gates and bars. So it's not maintained by the town. Correct. Okay, it's not plowed. Correct. And you can't get a building permit on it when it's in Class 6 status. Okay, so we're in agreement there. Yep. So now you've got to go to 5. We have to go to 5, possibly. Last call that the town adopted some guidelines for building on a class 6 road. They said you can build up to 600 feet for 18 foot of the road on house. There's, there's a new policy. Uh, that was, I mean, they, they adopted the guidelines that said you could go from that. Plus the 600 feet back. It's not like the way. Mine don't want to be pulling. Yeah, that's. But, but that's, there are ways. So it can go class 6, it can go class 5. Uh, depends on the outcome of the discussion with the select board. And the select board may lean on or depend on the planning boards for guidance, but ultimately it is the select board as the building inspector. The building inspector in the town of Brownsburg is the select board, although they designate a person to do inspections and so forth. And they are the agency that originates and authorizes building permits. Correct. So we need to have that discussion with them. Yeah. To make it a class five road, then they, they don't have to plow it. Sonny, I want to add though, but when this subdivision was originally done in 1980, it was with the specific restriction on this lot, the subject parcel, that no building shall be erected on the lot until the town reopens the section of Fresh Creek Road. By removing the gates and bars, and number two, the road is brought up to acceptable town standards. So that subdivision was specifically with those restrictions by the town. Yes. Okay. So, so you're looking to negate those? No. Nope. No. Nope. We're happy to upgrade the road to uh, uh, current subdivision regulation standards for. 500 feet of road, which would be 18 inches of gravel, topped with three inches of bituminous asphalt pavement. What's the width of that? 18 feet. And is there 18 feet available? Yes, there is. However, we don't know until we engage with the select board whether or not they ultimately want that. Okay? Um, if they do, great. If they don't, well, that's fine too. You know, we could we could improve it with gravel. Just for an example, example for an instance, we could improve it with gravel um, and agree with the town to have the Jenisons maintain it at no cost to the town. The improvements would be no cost to the town. Um, it, it depends on what the select board really wants. In terms of a look, how it appears, uh, in terms of what they want to have ultimately running down the road in time, um, but you know we can we can go whatever way is most desired by the, the town and the town vote, if you will. I didn't want me to interrupt you, Sonny. Go ahead and think. What's beyond seven three going down first Creek? Beyond seven three, the I'm uh, sorry. Uh, that's uh, a private property all the way from Fresh Creek, all the way up to um, Old Mill. Mm -hmm. All right. So what we're going to do is, yeah, well, yeah, we're going to have the numbers 
Well, the public speaking of your own. Yeah, well, you know, we'll just sit back and let them speak. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? I, I do. Please, I have some please, questions. Please. Um, Go ahead, you ask no, I'm, I'm still listening. <laughs> so, so, Mr. Jensen, um, I'm very familiar with this lot. I live in the vicinity. I walk the property all the time. So I'm very familiar with the steep slopes and, and the situation on the land. Um, I just want to call, um, you, you did mention several times that um, the house that you would currently reside in wouldn't meet current zoning, but that's really irrelevant. You built it in 85, it met zoning at that time. So that's that's really irrelevant to, to our discussion now. Um, the back lot that you said you just purchased in 2017, and you indicated that it was being taxed as a buildable lot, um, the deed in which you purchased to acquire the property for Mrs. Marston, I believe the transfer tax indicate a purchase price of $3,500. So, um, to me, is that a purchase price? I mean, did that indicate to you that it was a buildable lot? To me, that's a pretty nominal amount to pay for two it's, acres of land. It's been, a, it's been people tried to build on this for years, but because of the steep slopes and everything else, it, it's the whole reason was they, they couldn't. Because it's, it's, I mean, they could go in front of a board and, and get a variance for all these, and, and try and put it in this area. And it was a protest on the when this was approved in the late early years. But it's in this pond right here. And to get the setback and try and crowd the house in this pond with all the with all the steep slopes and stuff, you'd have to get variances from the board and the conservation board and everything else. Uh, Mrs. Marston sold it. She, she was sick of paying taxes all these years. That's why she wanted to get rid of it, so she didn't have to pay taxes anymore. That's why she wanted to unload it because she, she couldn't sell it to anybody else. But you acquired it with the understanding that there were restrictions. That, oh, yes. that know. you know, it know. may not be a buildable lot, that it was just going to benefit your current property and you were going to just acquire an additional two acres. Right. And I know that the road had the restrictions that you had to bring up to town standards, and that's one of the reasons we did it. Right, oh, right. Yes. And that, that's the concern that I have with with the setback of your of your house now being within that boundary of the Fresh Creek and within that 50 feet. Um, I'm not sure what issues that would pose if this does proceed forward. That's actually the widest, widest portion of Fresh Creek Road where his house is right now. Um, so it's arguably the best area to, or easiest area, I should say, to widen it. But specifically the sales price, I think that sales price also reflects the effort and cost it would take not only to get things, um, soft costs to get things approved, so that he could build on it, but also hard cost to do the improvements to Fresh Creek Road, which he knows would have to be out of his pocket. <coughs> and we're spending all that money, you're going to be pretty darn close to what a house lot would cost in town today. Right. Or he could just continue with the quiet enjoyment of the additional two acres on his lot mm -hmm. as it currently exists. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's the other option, is if, if it isn't a buildable lot, which, it, you know, um, you're still under the, the two-acre minimum requirement that, yeah, you're still under that two acres, so you're, you're asking for a buildable lot of, of about an acre um, that still includes slopes. Not as without the slope. You know, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but but the what you know, one acre is minus the wetlands and, and the uh, slopes. No, it still includes slopes. It, the grading in that one acre, if if I'm understanding this grading properly, it still is steeply sloped in that bottom portion that goes out to the wetlands. Yeah. 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 On this map here, it shows the slope. So it's one acre now. So he's going to be building over but here. It does but still, still yeah, it does still include slope. So you won't have two acres. Yeah. Well, if the table's wrong, then. No. Okay. So it's, it's one acre net if the lot line is adjustment is approved. And right now it is .87 acres net. 
Was, it, was that your question? Uh, yes. Okay. Paul, on the, I'm trying to remember the real estate transfer tax form. I think it is a place that indicate if, if it's being sold for less than market value. Was there indications on there why it was being sold for less than market value? So nothing about the, I mean, you, you said it's, it's because of the cost and the improvements, et cetera. None of those were included on the real estate transfer tax form. No, no, because they haven't been done yet. I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. The board, have any more questions or? Yes, and just one. Sure. Uh, uh, where is the, uh, the storm of water going from the driveway and adding the roof? It will basically and exactly follow where it goes down. So it's basically all from the uh, front of the lot um, straight down to the rear into the wetlands over those slopes. There are two slopes. We're good. I'm looking for a patient. Anyone else have any questions? I'd like to hear from. All right. So, so at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment. And given our, our procedure, I believe that, uh, and forgive me for being trying to go over any procedure here, so that, um, again, I'll recognize folks, raise your hand, you can take your name and address. Um, and I believe that the way it's supposed to work, and I don't remember the board may correct me, is that you want to ask a question to Mr. Conley, you're supposed to ask it to the board, and then. Mr. Colley will answer. So um, we'll open up public discussion and we'd like to go. Um, please state your name, please. Karen Staines. Karen Staines. Okay. 117 there. And we are the house um, adjacent to the Johnson's house. Okay. Um, I wanted to just um, say thank you for letting us address our concerns tonight. Um, we've lived in Rollinsford since 1978. Dick Dodier did our septic system. Um, we first lived on Sligo and then purchased the land directly from Ruth Emerson in 1981. The Genesons, there were actually two owners before the Genesons purchased the property. That's neither here nor there, but um, we purchased it right from Mrs. Emerson. She thought we were good caretakers. We liked her very much, and she visited us, visited us a number of times um, once we built her house. We built our house in 1982. We were actually very familiar with the setbacks at that point in time. And when we added our garage to the property, we actually had to angle our garage. Rather than sticking it straight out, we angled our garage so that it would remain within the 50 feet setback of the road. So we were very familiar with that. Um, I am going to just make maybe one or two points. Um, Maybe not much. Um, we're just very concerned about any planned action which would allow for an additional dwelling, an additional septic system, or a well on this recently purchased property. And we also um, object to the removal of the Class 6 restriction on fresh creek wood. I think it creates a dangerous precedence, um, and we are the closest to butters. Um, I'd like to introduce to you Sharon Cuddy Summers. She is an attorney we have engaged um, because um, we feel like this is erroneous actions, um, you know, seeking these variances. And we just, she's a lot more articulate than I am, so I'm going to turn it over to Sharon. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, address the board on a couple of points. Um, they reduced all of this to writing. Um, but I will, I won't, I'm not going to read it verbatim, I'll just try to uh, summarize some of the key things. I also included, to the extent that it's helpful, um, a couple of Google Maps which show um, the same property and which shows the Genesis property. I'm going to give a copy of the application. The one you gave me tonight, I will. Sure, we'll give that one to the chair. Okay. Thank you. I'm 
huge. So yeah, I, I know. I know. The recording secretary might want to talk to you. So, um, what I'd like to do is to uh, really just talk about the three key areas that are concerned to the stains. Um, and I'm also, by the way, I should say, just, just to start off with, we have no uh, issues or objections with the equitable waiver aspect of this application. That's, that's not where our concerns lie. Our concerns lie with the, the variance request. And really, there are three general categories that I would say um, that are of concern to us. Um, one is the fact that... Should we go any further? Sure. You, what's your name and what law sure. firm are you from? Sure. Um, my name is Sharon Summers, last, last name is spelled S-O-M-E-R-S. And I am with Donahue, Tucker, and Chindella, and I'll spell that. It's okay, I know that. Okay, okay. And I'm here representing Karen and Bill Stanks. Okay. Okay? So, as I, as I started to say, um, we have three general concerns. One is that the um, applicant under the statute is charged with the burden of providing you with evidence on each of the five criteria. And we would respectfully suggest that that has not been done in this case, and therefore the board does not have the legal authority to be able to grant the variance. Um, I'll, I'll go through these, why we think it's failed um, in a moment. The other two issues, which I'll discuss in further detail later on, is that the, the notice for this application we believe is deficient because we believe that an, yet another form of relief is required. I'll get to that. And then the third uh, area of concern that we have is with the issue of drainage. So let me, if I can, um, just go through the, the criteria for a variance and the ones that we don't think have, have met um, the requirements to allow you to possibly grant a, a variance here. So the first one we, we don't think that they, they satisfy the evidence is the issue of hardship. And hardship under the statute requires that, a, that an applicant show that the property in question is unique. That's number one. Number two, that there is no fair and substantial relationship between the purpose of the ordinance and the application of the property. And number three, that the proposal is reasonable. So here we have in the applicant's um, written presentation and the application tonight, no evidence that's been presented as to how or why this particular property is unique. And we would suggest that um, based upon what you can see in the, in the Google Maps plus what, what the stains could testify to, I took a quick peek out there tonight myself, but there is nothing unique about this property. On that side of Bear Road, um, in that particular neighborhood, there is a combination of properties with slopes and with wetlands. Certainly across the street on Bear Road, it's all flat and meadows and so forth, but not in that particular locality. And there's been no evidence of anything uh, or no argument that they've made that it is unique. So they failed on that part. Secondly, um, with regards to the uh, fair and substantial relationship, um, what I would say is a couple of things. One is that the property is zoned country residential district, uh, which your ordinance describes as the purpose is to conserve the integrity and natural qualities of rural open space for the betterment of the community. Additionally, if you this is a non-conforming lot, and the applicant acknowledges that. So if you look at the non-conforming lot portion of your ordinance, which is section 5.41, it states, no action shall be changed, changed, or taken, I guess, I may have misprinted that, to change the boundary of the lot unless it brings the lot closer to conforming to the requirements of the ordinance and it makes no other aspect of the lot more non-conforming. So in this case, what we have here is a, a situation where the boundary is being changed, but it is going to, um, in some respects, make one of the lots more conforming, but another lot less conforming. And um, in the, I noticed in the uh, lot area calculations that lot four will become more non-conforming because 5,210 square feet of steep slope is going to be added. 
Um, so I think right on the face of it that this application, well, we'll get into this in a minute, but it doesn't comply with Section 5.4. So if you take those two things together, um, together with the actual thing that they're seeking permission for tonight, which is to have, um, to require a, the net of being two acre sizes, that this is exactly the type of application which I would argue that the purpose of the relevant ordinances, that is the purpose of the CR district and the non-conforming um, lot language, is designed to prevent. And therefore there absolutely is a fair and substantial relationship between the purpose of the ordinance and the application. And then finally, um, <coughs> the application is not reasonable because the proposed construction will require access to the lot and I certainly understand the points that Mr. Connolly has made about state law with regard to Class 6 roads and access and so forth. But the fact remains is that the, um, the use of the Class 6 road, currently, first of all, the Class 6 road is subject to gates and bars. That is, as one of the board members noticed, um, or noted, is a condition of approval of an earlier subdivision. That condition um, attaches to the property and adheres to it even now so that the process to get to creating, say, a driveway to, to serve this, this, this new home, if should it go in, will require not only the adherence to the selectman's uh, uh, policy on building permits on Class 6, but will also require that that gates and bars uh, issue be dealt with. And I believe, sir, Sonny, is that your name? Correct. Yeah. Okay. I, I, you mentioned earlier that that would require town meeting action, and I haven't looked at that statute in a while, but I think you're absolutely correct, because certainly um, having a road be, become uh, discontinued and subject to gates and bars does require town meeting action. Mm -hmm. So all in all, I, I think that there's two levels of, of, of activity that's going to be required um, to make sure that the conditions of approval and the town building permit policy is, is adhered to. And all of that is, is, I think, something that this board should take into account as a background. But if, I think more importantly for this board to consider in terms of whether the proposal is reasonable or not, is that this board is being asked to um, facilitate the uh, creation of a new situation on Fresh Creek Road which is going to be different than that which exists right now, and which theoretically could impair the enjoyment of the public. I am assuming, I drove past it, and if it's a, like a classic road in my town, members of the public go up and down there. They go up and down there with their dogs, they go up and down there for walks, sometimes people take horses in there. If this doesn't become a, or is no longer a class six road, and or subject to gates and bars, all of those activities could be interfered with. The second aspect of the variance criteria that we don't believe has been met here um, is the public interest portion of the criteria. And that um, requires, in order for the applicant to have, to have met their job, they have to show, um, um, I'm sorry, I, I said this backwards. Um, the, in, in order to have the, um, variance not be able to be granted, there has to be a showing that the variance is going to unduly and to a marked degree violate the basic objectives of the ordinance by altering the essential character of the locality or threatening the public safe, safety, health, and, and welfare. So in the applicant's materials, this has not been addressed at all. There's been absolutely no discussion about um, how this is going to impact the essential character of the locality. Um, and we would argue that the locality is, is, as it currently exists, very much in keeping with the CR district. And by allowing a non-conforming lot, already non-conforming, to be altered to, so as to facilitate um, further building and with access via a gl glass, to a class six road subject to gates and bars, that you would be altering the character of the locality. And in addition to that, there's some. Um, as I said before, the use of the classics road um, would be diminished. The final thing that we know on the variance criteria that we don't believe has been met is the substantial justice test. And this, as I'm sure you know, it's a, it's a rough justice. 
It requires a showing that the um, benefit to the applicant is not going to be outweighed by a detriment or loss to the public. So here, the applicant will be benefited, of course, if the variance is granted, but there will be a, a loss to the public because of the impact on the Class 6 road. And also, there is arguably an, an impact to an individual because there's been no evidence presented on um, how drainage might impact um, the Staines property. And we have, we have serious concerns about that. So that's, in a nutshell, why we don't believe that the applicant has provided evidence which would enable you to grant this, this variance. Um, the second thing is kind of a procedural and kind of a substantive thing taken together. The notice, which was read by the reporting secretary at the beginning of this meeting, indicated that what is being requested for relief here is relief from the requirements of the footnote number nine in your table of uses, and that has to do with how the, 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 the net is calculated. But in addition to that, as I read to you a moment ago, I believe that section 5.4 of your ordinance, which deals with non-conforming lots, um, also requires relief because of the fact that the, the rejiggering of, the, of the, uh, the lot boundaries between um, lot three and lot four will create a situation, in other words, that ordinance specifically says that you can't change the boundary line unless you meet the two requirements, that you make one lot be more conforming and you don't increase the nonconformity of the, of the other lot. And that's exactly what's happening here. So I believe that the, this applicant needs to get relief from that ordinance as well. And that's not been noticed. So that can, obviously can't be acted upon tonight. And then the final thing that we have concerns about is the issue of drainage. Um, I know that drainage is, is going to be handled by the planning board if it gets to that point. However, um, and, and Karen can certainly speak to this with more um, accuracy and detail than I can, but I will tell you that the, the Staines have expressed great concern to me because their property um, is currently wet. Um, and they are concerned, and there's a lack of evidence that, that's been presented here tonight, as to how, um, how the stormwater might be treated. We heard some evidence presented in the, in the presentation tonight that it's going to flow in a, in a certain manner. But we believe very strongly that some more formal evidence needs to be prepared to, um, to answer those questions. And we would request that that be uh, done by this board. If this board asks the applicant, which they're authorized to do, as an alternative, if the board is inclined possibly to grant this variance, we would certainly, at a, at a minimum, ask that as a condition of approval, that the planning board be directed to seek a drainage study um, and then possibly have a peer review of that as well in order to gather the, the information that we need. So those are the three basic concerns that we have and we would uh, ask you to take those into account. And if you'd like to hear any further uh, discussion from Karen as to how the drainage operates on her property, I'm sure she'd be happy to address that. Thank you very much. Um, the gentleman in the orange shirt. My name is James Cushman. I live at 95 Bear Road. Uh, my question is, it's two downhill slopes, comes in a V, and the drainage goes right into that. There's a big wetland down there, and it goes right into that wetland. Now, if you put roofs and everything else up there without any way to contain it, Anything that comes off is going to go down into that wetland. And uh, I don't think that's what the intent was uh, with uh, keeping it in, in the manner and the presence that it's supposed to be. It, it's, it's going to ruin the wetland if it contaminates it. And it's a good possibility because they don't have any set plans on how to handle that water load coming off of it. If you ever go out there, it's very steep, and it goes right into wetlands. There's bogs all in there. I've hunted it. I'm sure other people have walked in it, and I, I don't agree with the fact that you may be granting a one-acre lot where a two-acre lot is required. It's a buildable two acres. I know there's a gentleman down the road from us, uh, Kim, 
he had to buy a four acre lot because there was only two acres that was buildable. The other two acres is wet. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else in the uh, audience was to comment? Mr. Putnam, you are uh, not participating as a uh, member of the board, you're a member of the public, so. Yeah, just please. a comment as a member of the public. Um, my concern as a member of the public is the, about the cumulative impacts. Um, as uh, the Stains have represented to the board, uh, steep slopes and wetlands are not unique uh, to this parcel not unique to this part of the town and uh, we have quite a few properties that are that front on uh, uh, ways that are subject to gates and bars and so my concern for the ZBA is the potential that there may be lots of landowners um, in this instance the the restrictions on this you know the the uh, the inherent limitations on the property, both by the zoning ordinance and by the conditions of the property, were kind of baked into the cake at the time of the purchase. But there, are, I think, are a lot of pieces of land in the town that would um, people would be glad to sell at below market value if they could get an or a, a variance to, to build on it. So I, um, I believe it is permissible for the zoning board to take notice under Bacon versus Town of Enfield of the potential for cumulative impacts. Uh, and so I believe that that may be another uh, area of concern that uh, the board may wish to address. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Members of the public wish to comment. Okay. Um, so does any? Uh, I think what we'll do is uh, turn it back to Paul for rebuttal or, or further comments based on what you've heard. Well, it would be difficult for us to rebut uh, this evening all the points brought up by Attorney uh, Cuddy uh, Summers. Um, however, I can briefly speak to um, the point she has made. Um, I'll start with the drainage. Um, certainly, the topography that was mapped pursuant to our survey of December last year shows that the drainage from the proposed building area on lot 7-3 is contained on and wholly on lot 7-3 until it gets down to the existing wetland on lot 7-3. It doesn't go off on any other lots. The land is slightly higher than Fresh Creek Road. To the extent this is germane at this particular board, I will tell you under my seal and stamp as a professional engineer and as a land surveyor licensed by the state of New Hampshire that what I have stated is correct and true. Um, we will have to address those items when we submit plans for a septic system with the select board and with the building inspector designated by the select board and the state of New Hampshire pursuant to their review for its granting a septic system approval. Um, but it's, it doesn't go on any, any, anyone else's property. Um, it goes down to that button, which is on the Jensen property, about 7 3. I have to rebut that. I'm sorry. Just, just so I want to give you. So just so we're to the procedure, so our rules of procedure say that... I'm um, speaking from my heart. It's okay, no, I, I understand, and, uh, but the rule, our rules of procedure say that um, the applicant is allowed time to rebut, and then um, there'll be time uh, given for the folks that are speaking before to rebut the rebuttal, so to speak, and then the board will deliberate and, and make a decision. So please, go on, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just I apologize. Just to be clear... We're not stating that existing drainage runoff from Phil and Bonnie's existing house at 125 Bear Road doesn't go onto other people's property. We're so basically the stains. Um, the lay of the land there runs right towards the stains property. But that's the existing lot. We're not talking about the proposed lot construction. We're talking about the existing lot does run down towards the stains. 
drainage from lot 73, the now vacant lot, stays on 73 and runs down to the wet and behind. Um, if, and I'm not sure, but if relief was required by section 5.4 uh, of the ordinance, um, certainly that can be uh, a notice to dealt with at a, a, another planning board meeting. I don't know that it can be dealt with this evening because it was not noticed under the, uh, the legal notice. And then finally, um, relative to the variance criteria not having been met, um, and specifically to the subject parcel being a unique parcel, um, are there other lots in the area with steep slopes? Yes. Are there other lots in the area with wetlands? Yes. But none are configured like this. No lot is identical to the other in the way that land was formed by the glaciers tens of thousands of years ago. And that's why we do survey, that's why we prepare plans, and that's why we set forth those plans before this board. So there are steep slopes on the land, there are wetlands, and they are in unique positions such that it doesn't prevent construction on Lot 73, but it would make it a little bit more difficult. And the reason it, we're here is to make it a little bit less difficult. We're asking for a more level of portion of land to be appended to Lot 73 and therefore make the request for building on steep slopes go away. We don't have to do that. We'd like to. We just think it's the right thing to do. Well, that's my response. How, how many um, roads in town, including in town, are Class 6 roads? How many Class 6 roads do we have this sort of good? The bars and gates. Well, just went to living here 26 years, give or take. Um, Fresh Creek Road, you have um, Lover's Lane or um, uh, Shady Lane. Yeah, mm -hmm. Lane. Um, some people think that there is a Class 6 road off of Rollins Road, mm -hmm. opposite across the street from Clement Road. Okay. Not, the, not the case. That's owned by the Dodge Farm. Okay. It's not a road. It looks like a road. It looks like okay. a Class 6 road, but it's not a road. Um, I think there is something down by Crockett's Crossing. It might be a Class 6 road. There's one more call. They cut the, used to cut the corner of Rollins Road. The Rollins Road. They run you behind a I thought it was Chase, but I thought it could be one with the name. You're right. The J.D. is property and, and... Yeah, I think it's a... Yeah, yeah it, it it's really right. get down through there yeah. now. <coughs> there's still parts of payment in there. No, you're absolutely right. That is um, that is Class 6 because it was um, given right. up by the state. Correct. Conveyed to the town and thereafter never maintained. So automatically after five years of not touching it, not maintaining it, it reverts to a Class 6 status. But yes, you're right. I, I don't think it's in the I think that's it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so for folks in rebuttal, I want to add rebuttal just, rebuttal. Just a, just a quick statement. The pink and yellow um, portions, as shown on there, he treats them as if they are just, you know, small pieces of land. They're about a quarter of an acre. Um, and that land has been cleared already. Um, it was done last January or February. So I can actually see very clearly, if we're talking drainage, and I respect you, Paul, I know you've got a degree in that, and I don't. The back part is going to drain that way. The side part drains towards our house. There are two different slopes there. And that's all I want to say. It's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a hefty chunk of land that we're talking about moving the boundary. Anyone else? Uh, yes, sir. Forgive me, Mr. Cushman. Mr. Cushman, uh, 95 that? euro. Uh, the slopes, the way they go, they come down into a V. It comes off of Fresh Creek and comes off the back of that piece of property. There is wetlands there, but it's not only his wetlands. It has to do with his wetlands also. So it's not just going to affect his property. It will affect his property. 
just want to make that uh, statement. Is he going to ask a question? Sure, sure. Uh, sir, is, you know, the, does wetlands feed uh, fresh creek? No, does not feed off of fresh creek. I know, does, does, the wetland, wetlands. does the water from the wetlands flow into fresh creek? Yes, yes it, it does. does. All right, anyone else? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to close the public part of the hearing, and before we go to deliberations, I see Attorney uh, Summers that you uh, asked that um, your September 12, 2018 um, letter and attachments be entered in the public record. Is that what you're formally asking us to yes. do? Okay. Yes. Um, so does any. Uh, Member of the board opposed that being entered in the record? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll have it entered in the record. And, and, and uh, Mr. Conley, all your documents were submitted along with the application. So, um, in terms of deliberations, who would, like, who would like to begin to talk about the Oh, well, please, please, absolutely. Yep. So, I want to clarify this. Two way, equitable waiver, and one line adjustment, correct? Yes. I've been on this board for a long time, and this board's never done a walk line adjustment. It's always been done by the planning board. Yes. So why would you be asking us to do something that they would do? The planning board could not grant. First of all, they don't deal with equitable waivers. No, no, okay. no. Yes. Lot line adjustment. They could not address the lot line adjustment without variance relief from this board relative to allowing lot. 7-4 to become a little bit less conforming relative to footnote 9. Whereas it's going to have two acres of land still, but it's going to have a little bit more steep slopes than it does right now. Is that specific what you're asking? Because you, because you asked, you specifically said she was asking for a lot line adjustment. Well, we're, we're asking for a waiver from footnote 9. But the lot line adjustment we ask. You're going to them folks. Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Who would like to start with the members of the board in discussion about what, what their feelings are about this? What their feelings or beliefs are. Well, I will start. Um, my concern, um, and I, I do thank the members of the public, it is helpful. I know for me personally, I thank the other members of the board to hear what everyone has to say. Um, I live in this area, I'm very familiar with the land. Um, I too own more than two acres because uh, my land is, my property is subject to wetland, so I own three and a half acres in order to acquire a two acre buildable lot. Um, those restrictions have, have been there for quite some time and um, we all have to uh, meet that burden. Um, and I don't think that this lot does meet that burden. Um, I'd be willing to hear if any of my fellow members want to try to persuade me otherwise, but with that respect, um, I just don't feel that, that, that the petitioner has met their burden of proof with regard to that. Um, and I am hesitant to uh, grant the relief um, for the equitable waiver. Because it does involve a, a road subject to gates and bars, it is encroaching on that portion. You know, we can leave that alone. We don't need to do anything with it. As, as the applicant has stated, it's been that way for 33 years. The town hasn't issued any violations against it. There's no reason to believe that the town will do so going forward. Um, I would hate to uh, tie the hands of the town in the future by an action that we take tonight that really isn't necessary. Yes, the thing that uh, you know, you know, concerns me is that the, that the subdivision was approved in 1980. And so now it's 2018, you know, and I was reading that the state recommends that after four years that, that if there was no work done on a sub subdivision and then you, uh, uh, you, know, you know, terminate uh, the sub subdivision. Just, uh, just like a bill of it, except the bill of it is one, one year, right? Like if we bring it out, and and the attorney 
said that was appointed a 5.4.1 in the ordinance non-conforming lot. No action shall be permitted to change the boundary of the lot, of the lot unless it brings the lot closer to conformance to the requirements of the ordinance. And it makes no other aspect of the lot or the structure on the lot more no, uh, non-conforming. So this proposal will be making lot 17-2 uh, more non-conforming by 6% by adding 5,200 square feet of steep slope. Try to get. Was there anything vested in this sub subdivision? And really, nothing. There was some trees clear, the shrubs clear, and there, there was no site improvement. There. So, also, it sounds like it's like the lot is really not a wasn't valued as a billable lot if there was a purchase price of thirty five hundred dollars. I mean, I just bought a lot of dollars for four or five years ago, but let me tell you I paid a lot more than thirty five hundred dollars for one acre. So. Sorry. Now, what's that with equitable waiver? I'm gonna say no to it. The only reason being is the onus is upon those folks. If they can prove to me that they met zoning in 85, they don't need to do it. If the 85 still has the same requirements as now, I would give them a waiver because they need a waiver just for their own home for any future stuff. But I wouldn't want to arbitrarily just think hand it up. I mean, we were pretty much told that it's not just a, a free ride, it's, it's involved. The second lot, I think we're kind of got the cut before the hoss. I think the hoss is a little behind it. I think until we can resolve some issues with Fresh Creek Road, I don't think I'd even want to touch the land issue. Because, I mean, there's been like three or four different statements made here tonight. Let's let them to do it. There was a town meeting that was required. There's another board that could do it. I almost say that those issues need to be resolved before we should go forward. Because once we once we allow that lot, then we're going to do something to trust people. Okay. All right. Anyone else? No, I'm thoroughly concerned about the um, impact it's going to have on the neighbors and the wetlands. That was my big concern when I saw this map and saw the degree of wetlands that were there. Um, that's most concerning to me and I, I feel that um, the drainage, the well issue, the septic system, that's all going to impact that and that's going to impact the neighbors and that would be a great impact at this point. Uh, let me say, me myself as chair, um, you know, when I, I read the application, I, uh, I thought this would be a a complex case, and a little bit I know we'll be here as long as we are. Um, and I and I do have uh, empathy for Mr. Jennison, but I, it it seems to me that this is is pushing the the limits a bit much. I think that um, I don't think that our ordinance permits what Paul, what you're suggesting, which is you know the sort of swap. You know, one one non basically swapping non-conforming lots, and I'm not I'm not saying that very well, but I, I don't think that that's what the, the statute was was meant to do. I and so going through the the five criteria, um, I don't think it's it's I think it would be contrary to the public interest granting the variance. Um, I I think the granting the variance would not be consistent with the spirit of the ordinance, and I do think there's a question whether or not you've actually Ask for relief from all the all the appropriate ordinances, including 5.4. Um, I, I don't think that, and again, the burden is your burden, your, your, your applicant's burden, that it results in substantial justice. 
Um, looking at four, granting this variance will not result in diminished values of surrounding properties. I think in a way you're, you're actually diminishing Mr. Jennison's own property, 7-4, by taking away less steep land and, and adding steeper land. So I think you're actually, usually when you think of that context, think of the context of abutting property owners, but I think he's actually diminishing lot 7-4. Uh, um, and I, I do think that in terms of the purchase price of of uh, seven uh, of the uh, land from Ms. Emerson, um, that it was essentially conceded that um, it was an, an unbuildable lot, and I am concerned about drainage to the the wetlands, and also, um, and we did have a training for the for the um, for this board not too long ago about taking consideration precedent and how you know um, if we take action that impacts. One particular lot, um, you can open it up to argument for other landowners and, and with other lots, even if it's not in this particular area. And it, it seems to me that there's a lot of um, a fair number of uh, Class Six roads uh, in town. So I'm, I'm I'm not in favor of granting the the variance um, myself. So um, as I understand, the way we're supposed to do this is to sort of come up with a, a motion that talks about, um, and then we all uh, would vote on the motion um, as opposed to us voting individually, vote as a, as a block. Um, and so um, I don't think there's anything that prevents me from not making that motion. So you want to vote separately? No, the, 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 the training is said we shouldn't vote separately. The, the, Okay. We should vote as a block, and so I'm going to um, make a motion that we deny the, the uh, request for both the um, relief from the equitable um, dimensions waiver on the basis that um, the standard of proof set forth in the in this particular statute was not met, and that uh, it is not necessary because it may have, it, it appears to have been in, in uh, compliance with the earlier ordinance at the time it was built uh, and that it may impact the town's enforcement of other similar properties. On the issue of, of the variance, um, I would add to my motion that granting the variance um, would be contrary to the public interest, that it's uh, um, that it's, it's not in the public interest to um, to allow this under the um, the issues that have been uh, brought forward in the discussion, such as the uh, drainage, uh, the not creating essentially a, a, a swapping non-conforming lots, um, and the fact this is a country residential area um, that uh, granting this variance is not consistent with the spirit of the ordinance. Um, looking at the particular um, things, uh, issues um, highlighted in that uh, statute is the, uh, that it, it would not uh, be contrary to those um, issues. Um, that and that I that um, creating a uh, higher quality of lot seven three uh, would be at the expense of for the quality of lot seven four. That granting the variance uh, will not result in substantial justice. Um, in that there are concerns about. Um, The um, the relative impact to the community um, and uh, drainage um, that uh, number four that granted this variance um, would result in diminished values of surrounding properties in, in particular to seven point four itself um, 
and that um, literal enforcement of the um, of the of the statute would not result in a necessary hardship because the property was acquired with the knowledge that um, building was uh, on it was very likely, and in fact that was uh, considered into the into the uh, purchase of the very very low purchase price for the property. So. Um, do I second that motion? I second that motion as presented. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, all in favor of Mr. the word. Yeah, you probably did. All in favor, um, say aye. Okay, aye. Aye. All opposed. All right. So it's a unanimous decision of the uh, of the ZBA. Um, I thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, and I especially apologize to everyone for uh, the rather uh, halting and, and, and uh, way which I presided over the meeting tonight, being uh, my first time being vice chairman of this particular board. And uh, I thank everyone for coming. Uh, and a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. We're adjourned.